Go ahead and have a seat. Well, welcome to church, everybody. It is absolutely impossible for me to make a smooth transition from that moment into the message, so I will not attempt it. Um, but welcome to church, and those of you guys that are online, welcome to you as well. You are our family, and we love you. Um, a big, big day. So, we're in Psalm 23. Uh, we are in Psalm 23, and we've got a doozy for you today. Um, it's not an easy one. So, um, yeah, giddy up, folks. Here we go. Um, Psalm 23. <laughs> got a, that's a good Oklahoma he ya right there. Um, uh, Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen? Amen. We know this one. This is a big one. Um, this is going to take us into some deep places this morning. But before we do, I want to have a little bit of lightheartedness. So I'm going to take us to King David who wrote this psalm. King David, we're going we're gonna to look at some things that he said that I think are pretty powerful. And I think they're going to give us some background on this psalm. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel 17 is the passage that we're going to read if you're taking notes. And what scholars believe is that Psalm 23, this psalm all about the good shepherd, we believe it was written by King David later in his life when he was reflecting on his relationship with God all across his life. Imagine an older guy sitting on his throne thinking about God but also thinking about some things he understands from his life. One of the things you might not know is that King David, when he was younger, he was a shepherd. Some of you guys also know that when he was younger, he fought against the giant Goliath. You ever hear that story and how that whole thing went down? Right before he faced Goliath in battle, there's this scene, there's this moment that happens between David, who is not yet king, and the king at that time, King Saul. David and Saul are sitting there talking, and Saul is not sure he wants to let David go through with this battle because he is, he is out everything, right? Like this, this other guy, this, this giant Goliath is, is a seasoned warrior. He's amazing, and David is young and in Saul's mind, inexperienced. So here's what he says. He says, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted, verse 34, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. I love that. I, I know he's... I know he's a giant. I, I know he's been this warrior all this time, but I've been a shepherd. <laughs> It's not what he expected to hear. So keep listening. Verse 34, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, David says, I go after it with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal would dare turn on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. Say to death. To death. To death. He clubs it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. David is a scrapper, amen? amen? <laughs> Man's a fighter. Um, he's also cocky. He's, he's very, very funny, young, little guy um, in the scripture. Um, he killed lions and bears. Oh my. <laughs> We're going to have one of those services. I, yeah, it's all right. It's good. Um, more fun that way. All right. So stop real quick because sometimes it's just, you just read the thing and you just take it for granted. But here's the deal. If you're watching your family's flock of sheep and all of a sudden a lion, a lion comes to steal a sheep, guess what happens? The lion gets the sheep. It's a lion. How many of you guys have ever taken on a lion before? Show of hands. Not true. <laughs> like, like, I knew that was a safe question today. Or bears. I mean, come on. 
And he makes it plural. He's like, when they came, I went after it. I got my handy club out and I beat it to death. Just some amazing stuff about David really quick. Number one, he cares enough about the sheep as the shepherd to not run. Because the easy move is a lion comes after the sheep and you say, sorry, dad, it was a lion for heaven's sake. You're one sheep down. I mean, that's how that's going to go. He doesn't because he cares about the sheep. They're his sheep. But the second piece is he's, he's a strong, skilled warrior. And he's able to fight them off. So those are David's two qualities. And a thousand years later, Jesus is going to pick up this line. A thousand years later, Jesus is going to talk about the same two qualities in himself. So Jesus, you might know, one of his titles is he is the son of David. The son of David because Jesus Christ in the, in the human line, he was born from the line and lineage of King David right down the line. But he didn't just come physically from the line of David. He came in the spirit of David. David was a shepherd and then he shepherded God's people because he understood how to shepherd. And when Jesus came, he came in the spirit of David because he came to shepherd God's people as well. And he's going to explain to us exactly how he does it. Look how similar the words are about to be. John 10 verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. Again, that's what we expect. He will abandon the sheep that hired hand will. Abandoned the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. So Jesus compares two kinds of shepherds for us. He says, one's a good shepherd, but the other one is a hired hand. They're just, they're just here because you're giving them a paycheck. I I had an old friend asked me when I was in college, they're like, you know, what if America ever went through economic collapse and all of a sudden God's people couldn't pay their pastors? How many pastors would we have left? It's a big question. And what's underneath it is why are you here? What are you here for? Are you called to be here or is it a paycheck? God help us, Amen that we would be here doing these things for the right reasons. God help me. But Jesus is like, there's two different kinds. And the the hired hand, because he's there only for the money, no amount of money is worth getting killed by a lion or a bear or a wolf, yes? So you go running. That's what the hired hand does. But he says, "Not, not him. He's the caring shepherd that protects Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So Jesus doesn't describe it here like David did. He doesn't say, I pick up my club and I beat the thing to death, which is fun, yes? Instead, Jesus says, the way I'm gonna protect you is I'm gonna sacrifice myself. And we know he's referring to the cross there. He's going to lay down his life. He's going to be just as protective. He's just going to be just as sacrificing as David potentially was. But Jesus is going to protect us in a different way. And he cares for us. He says, I know my own and my own know me. He knows the sheep. Jesus knows the number of hairs on your head, the scripture says. He knows your name. You're not a number to him. In Christianity, we're not just faces in a crowd ever. God knows you personally. And this is massive in this whole idea of understanding what it is to have a good shepherd. Several months ago, our family had to travel to Illinois and um, we couldn't take the dog. And if you've been here for any length of time, I've, I've told you some of the episodes in Millie Trueblood's life. And... Um, she's a little dog. She's a little tan dog. And, and, um, we had to put her in an overnight kennel and it was the first time that we had ever had to do that. And it was quite the experience doing that because, you know, you're handing this dog over and, and you're looking at these people and it's like, 
I bet you love dogs in general, but this is my dog. I bet you like animals, but you're getting paid to do this. I don't know if it's the same thing. Like, I've raised this dog. I know this dog's personality. She is Millie Trueblood, right? Like, like we have a relationship with her and because she is ours and we are hers, like that's the way that that works. I'm going to treat her in a certain way. And if danger would happen, Linda would jump in front of a bus for her. Probably not me, but Linda would definitely <laughs> do that. But I'm handing her off and I'm like, you're hired hands. No offense. I'm just not sure that, I'm just not sure that you're going to call her by name, right? Like you're going to see her running around in the yard and there's the little tan dog over there. You know, it's, I, I don't know that you'd protect her if a mountain lion showed up in the middle of Oklahoma and, you know, whatever. Again, no offense to them. But there's a difference, yes? You feel that difference today? Jesus is saying there's a difference in how there's a difference in how our good shepherd actually treats us, especially when the times are bad. And some of us have a view of God today. If I could just put the spotlight right on this, that when we go through the bad times and we go through the dark valleys, we're afraid that he bolts. And he doesn't bolt. He, is, he knows you. He loves you. And he is willing to protect you. So Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Pastor Ricky talked about that. God takes us to a place where we can pasture and we can eat. And it's good. Yes, the, the grass is green. It's good. And then there's quiet waters. Like he doesn't take us up to the edge of the rapids and say, drink, good luck. Like he, he takes us to a nice place and says, drink your fill so that it restores our soul. And then after that, God's got to move us to onto another pasture. We talked about that last week. We got to get moved to another pasture because if we stay in the same pasture, we will sheep it to death. We will eat it all right down to the dirt and it will not be good for us. So it says he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. That's him leading us out. And we need to follow the paths of God and not our own paths. Because when he leads us away, some of us, we take our own paths. Yes. And we get ourselves lost. We take our own paths and we get ourselves off a cliff or into a wolf pack. No, don't do that. Follow God's paths. But even if you follow God's paths, and this is the surprise moment in the psalm, even if you follow God's paths, you're going to go through the valleys. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So if I follow God's paths and I follow the shepherd and I go the right way, sometimes, even though I'm following God, I wind up in a dark valley. It doesn't mean that I'm going to get killed in the valley, right? Like, it's like sometimes I'm moving on to the next pasture and it goes down into the ravine and we're so deep down in there. I don't see the sunlight as bright as it was before. And sometimes me as a little spiritual kid in God's family, I get afraid. You ever get afraid? And he's acknowledging that. And he's like, I'm not afraid. I won't be afraid because I've got God with me. The dark valleys. So here's where we're going to go today. We're going to go all through this verse, one phrase at a time, because every single phrase of this particular verse, verse four, is jammed with meaning. And I want you to see it. So the very first one, even though I walk through, so number one, I will walk through valleys. If you're a Christian today, you will go through hard times, trials and tribulations in this life, guaranteed. Say guaranteed. 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 Other people have preached at you and made it seem like if you're in the real Christian life, everything's going to be rosy and they're wrong. This verse says different. Also notice the valley is not a destination. I will walk through the valley. Do you see the hope in that? It is not my destiny to stay stuck in the valley for the rest of eternity. That's amazing. I will walk through the valley. Next, the valley, it's the valley of the shadow of death. 
And just very, very briefly here, I just want to say that that phrase, shadow of death in the Hebrew, that is what's called an idiom. It's a phrase in the old language that is meant to convey a meaning, even though literally it might not make sense to some of you. And so you'll see in your different translations, that's translated different ways. Um, the, the word is Samawet, um, and it's from Sal, which is shadow, and Mawet, which is death. It's a, it's a combination, and it's an idiom, <clears throat> like we would say, when worst comes to worst. That's an idiom. It's just something that we say, and we're used to saying, and other people have said it, and what we're saying is, it's the worst of the worst, right? The shadowiest of shadows, the darkest of darks. That's what this is trying to say to us. It might be death. It might be the deathbed. It might be, it might be a cancer diagnosis. It might be when you've lost someone, but it might be any other darkest of darks in your life. And as soon as you start thinking about the darkest of darks in your life, some of us have had a lot of them. And some of you are in the middle of them today. The darkest of darks. Um, I think the number one reason that people cherish this psalm is because of this phrase right here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he is with me. And that phrase, it strengthens us, doesn't it? When, when I go to preach a funeral and I, I sit down with a family and, and a lot of times I'll suggest, you know, it's like I could preach that day of the funeral and I could use these different texts of scripture that are so encouraging for a family that's going through a death. I will always offer Psalm 23 and about 90% of the time they pick Psalm 23 and they pick it for verse four because we all see that and we're just so glad that somebody acknowledged how tough life can be and how much we need to hold on to God like an anchor. He says, I'll fear no evil. I'll fear no evil when I'm going through the dark valley and I want to be shaken in my boots. I will not fear. It's a choice. It's possibly the first choice in the psalm. Most of the psalm has got the shepherd leading the sheep onto different things. And in this moment, David stops and he says, I'm making a choice. The words change. It's important. Not only does he say, I'm making a choice, but he says, for you are with me. Everything else up to this point, he was talking about the shepherd. It was, it's, it's like worship. It's like adoration, right? Like he's talking about how good the shepherd is. When he's in the dark valley, all of a sudden he talks to you, God. The pronouns come in. You, God. It gets personal. It's a prayer now. He's reaching out. For you are with me. God is there. It's a choice. God doesn't want you to be afraid. He wants peace for you. Most of us, we spend way too long in the fear. And a lot of times, I'll just be honest, we don't see it as a choice. We need to pray that God would bring it into the realm of choice for us. You may need the help of the Holy Spirit and his power. But God wants peace for you. And then he says, for you are with me. The comfort is that God is there. There's a spot in the movies, The Avengers. I'll give you a second. Get into the Avengers headspace. Um, this is very important. Um, anyway, there's, there's the bad guy who wants to take over the world because the bad guy always wants to take over the world, right? And he's got this army that's on the way. His name is Loki. Loki is having an argument with Iron Man. Are you following? And Loki says, Iron Man, I've got an army. And Iron Man says, yeah, we've got a Hulk. It's a great moment. And it's totally going to play out because later on, the Hulk is going to like do his thing. And he's like literally going to punch a space, alien spaceship into the ground all on his own. It's amazing stuff. It's a great Hulk movie. I have an army. We have a Hulk. Right? Like I have confidence and peace because of who's here with me. Like I know I'm in a bad place. But if the Hulk is with me, I'm all right. Like that makes sense to us. And so the enemy of our souls comes to you in the midst of your shadow of the valley of death. Valley of the shadow of death. I switched it. 
The enemy comes to you while you're in the midst of it and says, look at this dark valley you're in. Your answer? Yes, but I have a Hulk. Yes, but I have a good shepherd. He's here and he knows my name and he knows the number of hairs on my head. And Jesus himself said that whenever the enemy comes at me, he'll never run because he's not a hireling. Just, we got to get it straight. Next, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The comfort isn't just from God's presence either. The comfort is what he's got in his hands, the rod and the staff. So I got a quick picture of the rod and staff for you because you get comfort from these. So there they are, one's short, one's long. Like the, the staff is this, this long, slender thing. Sometimes you've seen like old pictures, uh, drawings and cartoons where it's like, you know, there's like a little shepherd's crook at the top so that they can like grab sheep by the neck and pull them back onto the path. Because that's, that's how they would use this old staff is they would keep everybody in line. They would even count their sheep with it. I can show you verses where it talks about counting the sheep with the rod that they had. Or I'm sorry, the staff that they had. Sorry, the rod is the club. The rod is the weapon. It's an ancient mace-like device. It's shorter, heavy on one end. This is the club David was talking about. Clubbing the lion and the bear to death. This is what a shepherd carried. And so David, years later on his throne, writing about the fact that he is comforted, that God is there. He's like, yeah, but don't forget he's got a rod and staff in his hands. <laughs> like, like he's my shepherd and he won't run and he loves me and he knows me and he's armed. Your shepherd is packing today. Amen. Right? <laughs> like that's David's view of the situation. Do you see why he's more comforted? So, all right, so we got the truth in there. Now let's talk about our valleys and let's get a little bit more practical about the valleys that, that we're actually into. Because the valleys all across this room, again, it's the darkest of the darks. It's the shadowiest of the shadows, right? Like it's a real place. The valley is a real place. And some of you guys today, you're listening to this and this is a great little Bible study. And you're like, I'm learning some things. This is really great. Some of you guys are like right in the middle of it. And you're hanging on every single word because you're right in the middle of it. Or you were in the middle of it a while ago and you still don't understand what it is that you went through and you're trying to understand. And so it's like, so this, let's, we, we got to talk about it as if it's real because the cancer diagnosis is real, right? It's the scariest word in the English language, I think, right now. It's what we all don't want to hear a doctor say. And it's difficult to walk through. So is heartbreak and loneliness. So is being a young couple and finding out you can't have kids and you've desperately wanted kids. So is being betrayed by your best friend is super brutal. It goes on and on. So is, so is growing up without a stable biological family. And, and some of you guys have had time in the system. And that was, that was painful for you. You look back at that. Or maybe you're in it right now. And like that's a massive valley experience for you. Time in prison. Massive valley experience for some of you. Your, your mental health struggles and your depression and your anxiety. And, and, and some of you feel stuck. And you felt stuck for a really, really long time. Addiction that you can't shake free from feels like it's your valley, the dark night of the soul. Yes, the dark night of the soul. We've all experienced it. Like these valleys for us are super real and they scare us and they hurt us. And I am convinced that part of the reason the valleys hurt us so much as believers is because there are lies that we believe while we're in the valley. So I think the scripture comes against those lies and I think that's part of the healing that he's got for us. So some of the lies that we believe when we're in the valley, valley lies. Number one is if I follow God, there won't be valleys. And some of you were taught that. If I really follow God, if I knew Jesus for real, if I follow Jesus for real and did the right kinds of things, I would never end up in the valley and I didn't expect it. I didn't think that if I was following God, he would lead me to a place like this. 
And so I'm shocked. I don't understand. And we've been taught wrong. It's tough. And here's where we get set straight. Right there in verse 4, when I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil because it always happens. We always go there. Jesus says it also, John 16, says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. That verse was the first verse in scripture I ever memorized. When I was a teenager, I just received Jesus. This was my life verse. The idea that in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer was the version I memorized it in. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Mic drop. It's like, I got this. I know it's bad right now, but it will not end this way. And this is not your destiny. Massive for me. The next lie that messes with us. If I'm in the valley, it must be my own fault. And, and I'll just say this before I read the verse. Maybe it was your fault. Like maybe you did some stuff that got you where you are. For sure. I mean, like, like I get that. But it's not really what we mean when we say those words. It's your fault that you're in the valley. What we really mean is it's your fault. It was your decision that led you to the place of the valley. And because it's your fault, God looks at your valley as a special category where you're probably going to stay in the valley longer because you, right? Because if it was my fault, then he's probably going to make me pay. Probably not going to help me as much as the other people. Like we start doing this stuff and that's the stuff that really messes with our hearts. Here's the thing, whether you got yourself in your valley or not, your choice is under the blood of Jesus Christ who died for you. And when he died for you, he paid for your bad choices so that you don't have to pay for your bad choices. Jesus dealt with your guilt, dealt with your shame, dealt in divine justice. He dealt with it. So God's not going to make Jesus pay and then turn around and make you pay again. It's not the way it works. So yeah, you might have made some choices that led you down this road and now you're in this valley but God is currently treating you, if you are in Jesus, he's treating you as a forgiven son or a forgiven daughter. And he is, he is doing just what he would do, whether you chose it or not. Loving you, protecting you, all of it. Okay, now let's read this. John, John 9, 1, it's Jesus talking. Jesus saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin or his parents' sins? This verse right here could change your life, by the way, especially if you grew up in the church. Some of us have, sw we have swam in guilt for so long, we don't know anything else. And the disciples see this man who's born blind and they're just sure it's because he sinned or somebody around him sinned. Jesus says, no, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. And Jesus said this because he was about to heal this man's blindness. And he was like, no, God actually had a plan for this guy that he was going to show his glory and his divine power through this guy so that all these other people would find Jesus through this man's testimony. Amen. What a beautiful picture. Don't get stuck over here on whether or not he sinned. Of course he sinned. Of course the guy sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes? All have sinned. Of course this man sinned, but Jesus is saying the sin did not lead to his blindness. Stop attaching like that. And sometimes we aren't stuck, but it's harsh people around us, friends, family, church people, are saying it's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. Or sometimes they're not even doing that. Sometimes people come to you and they see you in that valley and you're telling them about it. And what they've got is a, a, a just do this kind of mentality with you. And they're saying, if you just do this, it'd be over. If you just believe right, it'd be over. If you just confess these words in this exact sequence, as if it's some kind of a magic language we have with God, which it's not. If you just did this, then your valley experience, you'd be out you just read the Bible more, if you just obeyed better, if you just, it's just do this and then you're done. 
And people come to you with that formula. And when they do, here's what happens. You just do the thing that they asked you to do. And then you don't leave your valley. And then what are you left to conclude? I must not have just done this right. And so it's my fault again. And here we go. And it puts the focus on you, puts the focus on them, said the focus on your shepherd. God, what do you have for me here? I'm in this valley for a reason, right? And you're only gonna keep me here. You're protecting me. You love me. You know the number of hairs on my head? Like, why am I here, God? And how long am I here for? God, what are you doing? That puts the focus on him. Don't fall for the blame stuff. Next life, I'm in the valley, I'm on my own. No matter how lonely you feel in your valley today, you are not alone. The shepherd knows your name. Hebrews 13, five. Don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. Love that verse. So this is another verse that will just absolutely change your life. Why is he talking about money there? He says, right, like, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. Like, why does he start with that? He starts with that because we're so inclined to make money our foundation. We're so inclined to put all of our faith in the future. And even now, our, our, our sense of stability, it's all in money. And he's like, don't do that. Instead, realize that God himself, he's the one who'll never leave you and never let you down. Don't, don't have your faith in the wrong thing. Have your faith in the right thing. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. You are not on your own no matter what you're going through. Next lie. God doesn't care that I'm stuck here forever. Again, when I walk through the valley, it's built right in there into the text. I go through the valley. You are not stuck. It is not your destiny to be there. Just trying to speak some life into some darkness that some of you guys have been going through. This verse, when you go through the deep waters, go through the deep waters, I will be with you, says God. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, it says in Isaiah. Don't we need to hear those words today? Some of you guys have been unemployed. I lost my job once and I was there for like five weeks on the unemployment line before I got my next job. And some of you guys are like, well, that's not very long at all. You're absolutely right. I didn't know it at the time though. At the time when you're on week four, you don't know how long you've got. It feels like a massively deep valley until all of a sudden it's done. But we struggle with hope, struggle to hope in God. God's got you. Okay, we got to end. I struggled in prayer about how to end this because I feel like some of you guys needed those lies corrected, needed good, clear teaching on how to get through this. Um, but I felt like God led me to this, this kind of final place. And so this is what I want to leave you with. Um, maybe don't hate the valleys so much because we're trained to. We're trained to hate pain, hate dark times. And I get it. I do too. But there's things in the valleys because the valleys are on the way, right? And so God's got something in the valley. When my kids were really young, when they were babies, sometimes they would wake up in the middle of the night. Maybe you've had this experience before. They'd wake up in the middle of the night and there was no discernible reason why. They just woke up and they wouldn't go back to sleep and they'd cry if you weren't holding them. And I remember on some of these nights, I'm like, I'm not gonna make Linda do it tonight. Right, like I'm gonna hold them. And you're walking around in the pitch dark in your dining room with this little baby, irrational baby, right? Probably Jake, most likely. Pa <laughs> Pastor Jake. Um, anyway, you're going through that. Um, but you look back at that stuff and you're like, 
those were the moments where the first threads of trust started to build between me and them. Like our bond started to come in. And for me and for them and and then you start thinking about the rest of their little lives, you know, growing up. And you're like, the, the number of times you're sitting there and you're trying to help them through the homework that they can't figure out. For them, it's a valley. And I don't wish pain or difficulty on my kids. Don't get me wrong. I don't. But those times come. And when I look back, I would never scrub the valleys out of our experiences together. I look back and I'm thankful for the valleys because in the valleys, so much was done, so much good. Helping them how to deal with bullies, their first heartache, all of the stuff, yes? Like being there with them and walking through it, like we'll walk through that together and, and just what that means. Is it possible that God looks back at your valleys and did not want you to go through the pain? No but they looks back at the valleys and says, I would never scrub those away from our relationship together because I walked through with you and you know what's here, what's been built, your faith, your trust. Back in 2020, if you go back to January of 2020, none of us even knew the word COVID then. It was right before all that happened. And... I had found out that my dad was diagnosed with cancer and we were hoping that we would have six months with him or possibly a year or, you know, if the chemo worked just right and experimental drugs and all, you know, the things that you hope in and like maybe we get even longer and he was just way too young and I wanted longer with him. And end of January and I get the call and they're like, you got to drive the 12 hours to Illinois. Like right now, we don't know how much longer you're going to have him for. And it was that, that level of an emergency. And um, so we went and we pulled our kids out of school and packed bags really fast and hit the road and made record time to Illinois. And we showed up and we didn't even know it then, but we had, we had less than two days left with him at the point that we arrived in town. And it was all just a whirlwind. And it felt like one of the worst, darkest valleys that I had ever personally walked through because he and I were buddies, okay? We, he and I were close. <clears throat> and I didn't remember then that my dad and I had had coffee probably three, four, five times in the last several years before that where he had essentially said, like he had made me executor on his will. And he was just like, hey, when it comes time for it, he's like, I don't wanna be drug out on like a whole lot of chemo and stuff. And I don't wanna live in a hospital and I don't wanna be taken down to a wraith of a person and, 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 and be miserable in my final days on this earth. He's like, he's like I've written it into my living will and I, I, I want this to go. If it comes to it, I want it to be quick. And he was looking at me, he's like, would you make sure that this happens right? Of course, I'm like, yeah. But during those two days, I didn't remember those conversations at all. Came to me later. And later I realized that God had given him the answer to his prayer by making things go fast. Hard for me to accept at the time. And for those final days, he was, he was lucid. And we ran all the family through and he had these final conversations with everybody and he got to say meaningful and precious words to all the people in his life that mattered to him, including myself. I got to sit there in that room in the ICU and I got to hear him speak words that showed me more solidly than I'd ever seen it before, just how deep his faith in Jesus was. I didn't know, but I saw it there. And then the day that he died, we got to the evening and we were all wrapping up and about to go home. And this one nurse, this one nurse who just had the wisdom and she grabbed me and said, hey, I don't think you wanna go home to bed tonight. She's like, I don't know if he'll be here in the morning. You might wanna stay. And so my sister and I decided to stay. And I mean, within an hour, he just started to tank. And we ran him up to another room where they could start giving him drugs to make him more comfortable. And 
everything was happening so fast and all of a sudden I'm thrust into a room with them and, and I'm watching him pass away basically and, and my sister is there and this is super hard on her and it takes me a while to realize how hard it is on her because I'm a pastor and I've, I've been around death a whole lot. I've seen a lot of people pass away and, and she's really struggling. I got to be there and I got to help her through that. And then all of a sudden this nurse that's there, she says, hey, I'm a believer. She's like, you wanna pray? And I'm like, I'm a stinking pastor. I should have said that first. <laughs> but she says it, cause I just didn't realize it was happening that fast. And it's like, and all of a sudden, there we are, we're holding his hands and we're holding each other's hands and, and we're praying and we're ushering this guy into glory. And it's just like all of these things, right? And you're like, the shepherd never left me. This is the valley of the shadow of death. He never left me. He was loving me the, the whole way through. And that list of blessings that he gave to me throughout that whole thing. And just, you know, I stand back from it and I'm just, I'm awed by it. It's like, how did I deserve all of that? The answer is I didn't. But I, I didn't unpack that list of blessings until much later. Probably six months later, eight months later. When you're in the thick of it, you don't see those things, do you? when you're in the thick of it, like many of you guys are in the thick of it today. You can't see all the things that he's doing. But the valley is precious to him. And he's armed. Yeah, amen. Why don't you guys stand? going to pray for you and then we're going to sing. I want to let you know that after the service today, and we, we do this every week, we have a prayer team that's in that back corner of the room and they're super subtle, right? And they just kind of stand there. And if you, if you need them today, they're going to be there for you today. And there are people who know how to pray and there are people who know how to keep your confidence. Um, but if you just want to be with a person today and just kind of explain where you're at, what your valley is and get some prayer from somebody, Go and, go and see our prayer team. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your truth, God. I thank you, God, that you don't, you don't just have a book, God, full of philosophy and slogans for us, God, that you've got truth that reaches right into the, the tough places of our lives, God, every single moment of our lives where we need you the most, God, and you've just got this healing truth for us. Thank you, Jesus. So Lord, I wanna pray for the people, God, who've been through the darkest of darks, God, and maybe they came out confused and they aren't sure where it is that you were in the midst of that. Jesus, would you take my brothers and sisters by the hand, God, would you start to reveal to them, God, where you have, where you were present, fighting for them, loving them for those that are in the midst of it right now. God, I pray for that, that choice to not fear. We confess to you, sometimes when we're in it, Lord, we don't feel like fear is a choice. Fear feels like the only thing we can do sometimes. So what I ask is that the Holy Spirit would come and give us power to choose trust instead to trust you instead. Lord, you love us, you fight for us. Thank you, Jesus, in Christ's name.